Yes. We see you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, good morning, afternoon, good evening to all of you. It's really great to see so many folks on uh, on the call today and for part of this uh, foundational academy. Um, I really have been super excited about uh, the Open MRS community pretty much since 2006 when I started. Um, I was directing the Millennium Villages project um, uh, information systems component, and I was part of the um, 10 different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, project. I'm currently directing the Columbia International eHealth Laboratory, which produces the CL Dictionary, which we're going to talk a lot about today. And um, I've been running with OpenMRS um, kind of as their terminology guy, you know, ever since 2006. So it's been a while. Um, I used to actually, I just recently retired last year from Intelligent Medical Objects, where I was chief medical officer, which is um, a really, it's a billion dollar um, company that provides terminology to pretty much 95% of the United States and, and many of the other English speaking markets. So, you know, I live and breathe this stuff in my, uh, in my day job uh, or used to, and now certainly a lot within OpenMRS. So I'm going to hopefully um, give you guys uh, an opportunity to give uh, to get into terminology and the importance of the concept dictionary within OpenMRS because it is really quite unique, and uh, also let you know that I'm you know available. And so you'll see me on Slack, you'll see me on um, uh, on, on email, and I run office hours every uh, Thursday, uh, uh, two hours from now. Uh, generally, can find me if you want to ask me questions. So uh, hopefully yesterday you, in the conversation around the data model, um, you sort of understood a little bit more about sort of how OpenMRS leverages forms, whether they're the actual forms or whether they're screens like an OpenMRS 3 um, that are driving information from the user into the database. And so typically on a screen, you're gonna see that there are multiple data areas or data fields for which information is being collected. And that information might be the date and time of when this uh, event uh, happened. Certainly there are demographics like patient name, age, sex, and so on. And different things like uh, observations about the patient, like polls, pain, other kind of aspects uh, where we might either ask questions to uh, the provider or there might be a, a field to implement uh, or to input, sorry, something numeric, um, let's say. Now, um, what Ellen may have mentioned is that, you know, each of these areas from the user interface go to different places in the database. So, you know, the date and time of the encounter usually goes to the encounter uh, table. Um, the form that's being selected or used goes to into the form section. And then the places for um, observations and for uh, places that are demographics about the patient or person table. What we're going to focus today is mostly around the OBS table because the concept ID and its various other columns are associated with the um, uh, capturing observations about the patient is really where open MRS shines and is different from most other electronic medical records. Most other systems actually have a separate field in the database, a different column essentially, for everything that they're collecting, like the pulse or the respiratory rate. And so people know what is in that, the meaning of that column of the database based upon the name of the column, which is tied to the database, which could be different depending on all the different ways that people sort of set up their system. What is different about OpenMRS is we use what's called an Entity Attribute Value Database Model, which is EAB. And what that does is instead of having a really wide table, right, with all these different columns for everything that you might want to capture about a patient, and every time you want to add a new thing to capture, you have to change your database. We have a column for the table, essentially what we're doing here, which is our observations. We have a column essentially for the concept, what is it? Is it pulse? Is it pain? And then we have a set of different columns, but they're basically for whether it's a numeric value, whether it's a text value, whether it's a, uh, another concept or a coded value. And this is really powerful 
because it means that we can add new things to our database without having to make any changes to the actual structure of the database. Um, and this very, so this allows us to collect things really, um, you know, in a very flexible way. Now the challenge, of course, is, well, how do I know what's in that column of concepts if I don't have a dictionary? And that's where the concept dictionary becomes so important because essentially it's the thing that says that the pulse in that column of observation, the, the concept ID for pulse is a actual pulse or heart rate for the patient. Now, why do we even care about how data is in the database? Well, it's essential for just about everything that we want to do, that how we capture data in the database matters. Because what is in the database drives everything from reporting to the Ministry of Health. Maybe you have a disease registry. Certainly there's opportunities for um, you know, uh, clinical decision support. And all of these kinds of things depend on knowing that there's actually a field in the database called pulse. <laughs> And it has this kind of, you know, it's beats per minute or something like that. And so you really have to control what actually is that users are essentially allowed to put into the database. But you don't want to drive that control based upon technical terms or codes that are associated with billing or um, what a, a report might require. Because clinicians actually think clinically, right? They don't necessarily know what ICD is, and you may know from previously what an ICD code is for WHO reporting. Um, they are thinking about, well, the patient has a heart attack. And so you need to have a clinical term that may or may not be the actual same term as what's being used in the uh, for categorization or coding. And this is really the key difference that CL has included, and certainly my prior company, IMO, included as well, is that you want to give the, the, the users the terminology in the way that they're familiar with, and this could be in multiple languages, I'll show that in a minute, and allow the dictionary in the background, the concept dictionary, to do the, the heavy work of saying that that heart attack with ST elevation goes to such and such an ICD code. And we know that ICD, for example, is changing. So most countries right now use ICD-10, uh, WHO. But there is an ICD-11 that's actually coming out right now and are expecting people to migrate. So if your whole system is based on ICD-10 and now you have to go to ICD-11, you're gonna to have to rework all your screens, all your lookups, all your dictionaries, or you use an interface terminology or a concept dictionary the way we do, which I'll tell you in a minute, where the term stays the same. Heart attack never changes. And if the codes change, if you need a SNOMED code, if you need a LOINC code or whatever, the, the database will tell you what it is. And this is very important. The other thing to recognize is that patients don't come in with something called other disease. You know, it, that, that's a category. You know, those terms, ICD codes were meant to categorize patients into various buckets to be reported. But patients don't actually have other disease. They have some sort of disease, which just happens to go into the other bucket. And that's another reason why we don't just put forward ICD-10 codes in the concept dictionary for a selection. So once you have the terminology in these concepts, we can code them, just as I've shown. Like it could be IC10, it can be SNOMED, and, and, or whatever. And those codes can then be grouped together into what we call value sets or concept sets, because there may be multiple codes that actually represent the same big disease, like diabetes, you know, uh, coronary artery disease, hypertension, high blood pressure, there may be multiple codes that mean each one of those diseases. And those value sets then go into driving what we call cohorts, which are groups of patients. So when I'm trying to do a report or I'm trying to do clinical decision support, the 
I need to understand who are my patients with diabetes. So I have to know what are the value set for diabetes. And then that value set tells me what are the codes I need. And those codes tell me what are the actual clinical terms. So the clinical terms are driving all of these things, which ultimately are used for making this uh, system workflow for reporting, analytics, research, anything you wanted to do. This is why the concept dictionary is so fundamental to what we do with electronic health records. So you may have seen something like this with Ellen's talk, but I can't remember if she included it or not. But this is what the uh, pretty much kind of what the concept tables look like within OpenMRS. Now the areas in dark blue represent the terms that we're talking about. So they were the the left side of that screen. Things like heart attack with ST elevation. They're the names, and drugs are just a, a table that is a more specific view of the things that a, a, a clinician or a user might select in the user interface. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that first. So what does that look like in OpenMRS? So here's an example where we have a concept called acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, due to severe ARD, our, our acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, which is you know, SARS, CoV-2. Now, every concept in our dictionary must be unambiguous. It, it, there can be no confusion as to what this concept is. And so every concept must have a fully specified name in English or in uh, your locale. And that must be unique across your language or locale. Now, there may be uh, and oh, sorry, so there will always be a identifier for that concept. And that is what we call the OpenMRS concept identifier, which is the one that's more easily, if I'm, I'm referring to something either in my forms or maybe when I'm talking to someone about what this concept is, you can use this number, like this 165867 number. But it also, more importantly, has a, a unique ID, a UUID. And that's that long 16 digit number below. And then typically, a concept will have other ways to say the same thing. So that fully specified name is way too big a mouthful to, to have in your forms. But that's to demonstrate in the dictionary that, there, that I know exactly what this concept is. In the form, I might use a short name like ARDS due to SARS-CoV-2. Or I might use one of the synonyms, which is just another way to say the same thing. And synonyms don't necessarily have to be unique. They can go to multiple concepts. And you'll notice within OpenMRS, if you search for a synonym, it will tell you that it points to this big long thing, acute respiratory sy distress syndrome due to so, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Now the next part is really what matters for the technical aspects. You know, the top part matters to the user. That's what they care about, whether or not they actually see a concept that they understand they're trying to document the patient has a disease or they want to be able you're a, you're a form builder and you want to make sure that you you know put the pulse in the right place in the dictionary that's what those top blue boxes are for the bottom ones are really what drive all of the downstream functions of those codes right so if i'm wanting to report to the ministry of health using icd-10 or I want to group together the patients um, for some sort of analytics, I might use SNOMED. If I'm using laboratories and I want to make sure that my laboratory, uh, what we call interoperability, the ability to send a lab from a lab in result from a, a lab to the database, to the EHR, maybe it needs to have a LOIC code. So I'm going to, these bottom codes in green and potentially the, in orange here, are what we call the reference tables. And so every concept that we just talked about, this is that 165867 concept, is linked to multiple different reference terms. And this is important because the use case might be different. If you're trying to report to WHO or to your Ministry of Health, you might need ICD-10 codes now. Um, and in this example, you can see that that single concept actually mold maps to two different ICD-10 codes. So you can't just have one ICD-10 code in the dictionary and have them pick U07.1 because if you want that ARDS 
um, due to SARS, you actually needed two codes in ICD-10. Now, when ICD-11 comes along, you might want this combined code, this RA01.1, CB00 code, right? And if you were trying to do analytics and research, you need to have the SNOMED code. And so that's there too. And so that those bottom two codes, there's just one code that represents that concept. And so they have a same as relationship between it. So there's a, uh, a table that describes the, the maps between the concept identifiers and the reference codes, whether or not they are sort of partially describing the concept or whether they're fully describing the concept. So when you're in OpenMRS, most people start by having a list of concepts that they need, either from a form or from a previous uh, application maybe that they need, and they need to create concepts in the dictionary. Now, this is the kind of where you start from kind of uh, place. And if you notice, there are the same kind of rules associated, I mentioned uh, before, but this managing of a dictionary is actually pretty important. And I'll talk about it later, why CL is even here. Because every concept that you create, as I mentioned, must have this unambiguous, unique name that, that makes sure that people understand what that concept actually is. Now, names, concept names that appear to the user need to be consistently cased. That means the, the, whether or not they're capital letters or not. And even in the old versions of many of the dictionaries, you might find some things in all caps, but we recommend that you use the sentence case, which means the first letter of the term is capitalized and not the rest, unless they need to be. As I mentioned, synonyms do not need to be unique. Search terms are used for indexing only, and that the term data type is actually driven to based on how you're being collected. Like if it's a numeric value, it's gonna be a number, uh, remember, it's going to be numeric value. If it's text, it's text and so on. And you only use um, an A if it's an answer or a set, something that's grouping together other things. And coded answers can be created before or after the question. It depends on how you're doing it. I generally like to have create the answers that I need for a question so that when I come to the screen and I'm creating a question, it's quite easy for me to add them. You can switch between languages, so the, how your locale setting is in your, um, uh, in your global preferences. You can um, change and add new languages if you want the uh, user interface. Uh, or sorry, when you switch the user interface, you want the concepts names to change. You can do that too. You can add additional synonyms to make it easier for people to uh, find the term that they're specifically looking for. And you can edit the list of answers depending on whichever um, question is, is picked. And lastly, you can add mappings. And mappings are either the, um, to things like ICD-10 or to SNOMED, or you can add set members or answers as I mentioned above. Now this is, a, as you can imagine, a lot of work, okay? And so I understand why there was a huge challenge in the early days of OpenMRS for people to kind of get started and once they created these dictionaries, they had all created them individually and independently. And the data that was collected in one OpenMRS server wasn't interoperable or wasn't shareable really you know, in a way that was, could be understood with another server. And this is why we created CL. And CL, as you may know now, is probably the pr predominantly shared concept dictionary where people start with. And so um, we'll talk a little bit more now about CL and how to use it to get started. So currently CL is used by lots and lots of people in many different countries. Um, we're not actually sure because we can't tell once it's been implemented inside of OpenMRS whether they took the dictionary from Open, uh, sorry, from CL or not. So it's kind of a, a, a loose number, but we know that people all over the world, in multiple different um, countries are using CL. Now, originally, we can thank IMO for this because uh, they initially, because I was working for them, um, provided a core set of concepts that were used for um, in, in an open source way to drive the CL dictionary. But since then, which is now almost 15 years ago, 
um, we've been able to add a lot through community input. And when a new organization um, like NSF or certainly like Partners in Health needed new concepts or they decided they were suddenly going to work on oncology and cancer, they needed con cancer concepts, we went ahead and added those to the CL dictionary. Now, originally, these were all distributed via a flat file and um, a Dropbox, which you can still get CL in multiple versions for, of OpenMRS that way. But now, with the introduction of Open Concept Lab, we, this is the, the way that we recommend that you get it. So what is CL? It's 52,000 or more concepts that are all sorts of different things, diseases, procedures, medications, laboratories, answers to questions like, uh, or questions and answers like, how many nights did you sleep under a bed net in the last week? Um, or what is the reason that you stopped antiretroviral therapy? Now, a lot of these concepts were originally part of the AMPATH uh, dictionary that was started out with OpenMRS, but since then, as I mentioned, we've grown, grown to support many other use cases and many other uh, areas within medicine. They, they come in multiple languages um, because we manage CL in English. Everyone, um, you know, every concept has an English fully specified name, and, but we have others, Spanish and uh, French and even Russian or Dutch, and some in Swahili and, uh, and, and many in Creole to support the their various use cases. So not everything in the CL dictionary has a language translation uh, into a different, multiple different languages. But if you need one, I'm really interested in um, working with you to make sure that we add them. Um, we generally update um, on a monthly basis. So every month, a new CL dictionary comes out. And there can be um, hundreds to thousands of code updates in every year, every year based upon changes to the master code systems like ICD and SNOMED. And like when no, and COVID happened, you know, constantly we're adding new codes for the different uh, vaccinations, um, all the different ways that things can be tested for, and, and so on. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to help take these codes and these reference sets that are so important, like ICD and LOINC and so on, and use something like CL to get this out to everybody easily. You know, so that they can then select these terms, has the right clinical terms, and then also is able to um, generate the right codes in a way that is the same across all the different servers, which means that um, everyone is using the same dictionary, which means they can use the same forms, the same reports, and everything. But what we know is that every country generally tends to take some subset of those, all those codes and say, these are the codes we wanna use in Kenya, for example. Or maybe we wanna add a few codes that aren't part of CL or reference sites that are specifically for use in our country. Then you have organizations like Partners in Health and they may say, well, yes, we work in Haiti or in Kenya and we need to have their dictionary, but we also have our own customization, things that we want only our servers and our providers to use. And then finally, there's a customization all the way down to the individual hospital or clinic, because maybe there are certain drugs that are only available in that clinic, or you know, they're, they're not other drugs that are available. They only have a certain set of drugs. And so there's a customization required there. So as you can see, this gets pretty complicated. You're, you've got to keep everything kind of in line. And so what's really needed is a, is a shared platform, something that allows us to do all of this, to manage the concept dictionaries, plus all the customizations that we need for those concept dictionaries. And that's where Open Concept Web comes in. And I don't have time to really go through a lot of details about uh, OCL, but uh, Let's just say that this has been um, a remarkable advancement in managing this over multiple different users in multiple different sites, not using Dropbox. It's dynamic and it's interactive. You may see stuff on the wiki for um, a, uh, we had something called OCL for OpenMRS. There was a separate pages that we had uh, a, a module that we specifically used to help um, build concepts within 
um, OpenMRS, but store them in Open Concept Lab. We've pretty much moved over now to this, which is the Open Concept Lab. And this allows you to both select concepts from CL or potentially another data source and modify them if necessary, but more importantly, group them together into um, a dictionary online that you can then subscribe your OpenMRS to with the OCL module. So you actually, there's a module with an OpenMRS that takes whatever you're working with here online, all the information, as you can see, the, the, that concept that I just mentioned, um, although I noticed that the number is slightly different on that one, um, but the, uh, the maps to the ICD codes, everything like that is all prepared for you online. You push a button, it subscribes it, it syncs it down to your OpenMRS dictionary in your server, and there you go. You're all ready to, ready to go. So I wanted to talk a little bit at the end here, um, uh, and maybe I can just do, I've got a few more minutes, and I wanna leave some time for questions. So let's, um, let me talk a little bit about terminology management. Um, it's not for everybody, and part of the reason why CLCL has uh, and OCL have become so important is that the expertise necessary to sort of manage a dictionary is not commonly there. Now, I and other folks within OpenMRS are really keen on raising your um, awareness and training around terminology. You need to have the foundational system and understanding to know about what a concept dictionary is. But you might have somebody else who's ultimately responsible for the dictionary itself, the content of it. And there are different levels of understanding. And so as if you're interested or there are people within your country or within your organization who are interested in learning more about terminology management, the actual content, have them reach out to me and let's make sure that they're in con connection with OCL and have an account on OCL. And we can gradually improve their uh, terminology management skill set and level so that they can become a manager within their country. Now, uh, countries like Kenya that have their own version of uh, OCL and they're managing their own content dictionary clearly need to maintain a high level of skill. Um, but if you are in a uh, kind of a simple use case, and you're just really wanting to leverage CL primarily to do it, then you don't need as much content knowledge. You just need to know how to use uh, OCL. So um, let me stop there. And uh, we have a few more minutes for, for questions. And I see I wasn't paying attention to the chat message. So let me take a quick look there first. Uh, so Melinda asked, do the variety of concepts exist in the same space? If so, is it something to be aware of as an implementer? Yes. So as I mentioned that there is one concept dictionary for all the different types. And there are, uh, with the exception of drugs, which have their own special table. And it's not that the, the drugs, there's a, for the medications, there's a, a concept in the concept table for the medication. But if that medication is um, delivered in a 50 milligrams tablet versus a 100 milligram capsule, that information is what's kept in the, um, in the drug table. So it is important as an implementer to understand when you're selecting those concepts for your forms or for your screens, that you actually are picking the right one. And this is one area where CL helps a lot, because if you go directly to SNOMED, for example, which is this main reference dictionary, and you try to search for something, you may find the right name, but it's not the right data type, essentially. It's not, it, it's not, it's an answer, not a question code. And so CL will sort of disambiguate that or basically make sure that you know and make sure that there's a description in the in the actual concept table that says you're supposed to use this for the question and this concept for the answer. So that will help an implementer um, know which is the right concept to use. But there is multiple different selections. There may be different ways, different concepts in the dictionary because we have to manage all the countries that are using it. So there may be some need, and this is where some of the experience comes in, or you can ask me, 
or more importantly, ask your own uh, subject matter experts, is this the concept that is really needed for whatever they're collecting? Because sometimes when they write it down on a piece of paper or it's on a form somewhere, they're not very clear as to what it is. And you have to go back to them and say, what do you really mean by this question on the form? Um, Raphael asks, how do you handle terminology evolution? SNOMED releases deltas at least every six months. Well, SNOMED actually is going to something called um, uh, uh, continuous release. And so they're going to basically be making changes all the time. CL manages those changes as soon as we are aware of them. Now, what that means is that it, it's basically monthly when uh, CL makes our updates. And when we do so, if you're using Dropbox, to get these tables, it's a kind of a big deal because you have to go in, drop the table out of your dictionary and reload the table from Dropbox each time. The idea behind OCL was that when I produce a new CL release and it goes up to OCL, that you actually are subscribed to that and you get a choice as to whether or not you want to update your dictionary based upon the changes. So you can choose whether or not you want to get it but the most important thing is that an implement, as an implementer, you are not responsible for making those changes. Um, in, a, in other words, knowing that this concept changed its ICD-10 code or something. So that would be important. Linda also asks, would customizing concept dictionary break interoperability? If so, how to mitigate it? Well, so CL is primarily designed to ensure interoperability. So if you think about it, what we're making sure is that everyone's dictionary has a map to these standard reference codes like ICD, SNOMED, et cetera, LOIC. It is possible when you customize that you could break the meaning of that concept. In other words, if you change the name of that concept and it's not really a synonym, you changed it um, instead of saying um, that this was a severe rash and you simply said i i just want my fully specified name to be rash you've eliminated the severe from the definition of that rash then actually you have done what is called a breaking change you no longer can use the cl identifier to make sure that you're getting the right snowmed code because the there's a, probably a different snowmed code um, for severe something severe rash than risk rash so there are things called breaking changes and non-breaking changes and hopefully ocl is going to manage that in the future to make it quite clear when you're making a customization that doesn't uh, actually, or that breaks the meaning. Now, if you're talking about customizations like adding additional concepts into CL or into your dictionary that are not in CL, that also breaks interoperability because those concepts that you're adding, either as a country or as an, as an individual terminal uh, server, that you no one else knows what you just added. So what we ask of you is that you let us know whenever you're adding. And sometimes there are things that are so specific to your use case or to your country or to your hospital that there's no reason for it to be seen by everybody. And therefore, um, we're actually not gonna add it to CL. But otherwise, we'll try to add it and we'll give it to everybody else. And I know we're actually over time right now. So um, let's see. Is it possible to list all concepts from the main admin page? Indeed, there is an opportunity to download all from OpenMRS, as well as if you're using OCL, you can uh, you see there as well. Uh, what if format is useful for importing the ICD SNOMED code? Some of these are more technical, which maybe I think I would pass at this point, but I will just uh, kind of reaffirm that in general, you do not want to be leveraging ICD, for example, as your term that the clinicians are choosing from. You need the ICD codes because you obviously need to report them, but patients don't have other disease of such and such. So you want to use CL and then let CL give you the right IC10 codes. And if we're missing an IC10 or a SNOMED code, let us know. We'll make sure we'll add it. Um, and, oh, it looks like Grace already answered that. Thank you, Grace. Um, can con additional country level subsets be added? Yes. Look, Grace, thank you for doing this. Um, great. Thank you. Sorry. I was... Uh, one minute over, but thank you all for this. And uh, as I mentioned before, um, I'm available on Slack, on uh, Talk, as well as every Thursday, uh, 
about one hour and 15 minutes from now um, that you'll see on the OpenMRS calendar. And anyone, no appointment necessary. <laughs> Just come on and ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, uh, for that wonderful presentation.